All right, gentlemen, I want to finish up Parsha's Chukas today. We've got a few more things that we have to take a look at. And uh, the first thing you need to look at before we even look at the next idea is to turn back to Parsha's Toldos. Look at Parsha's Toldos, uh, where Yaakov gives the bracha, Yitzhak gives the bracha to Yaakov, and then uh, Esav comes in for a bracha. After Yaakov takes the bracha, Esav comes back in. And Esav starts crying, and he says, don't you have a bracha for me? So Yaakov says to him, on Pasuk, um, uh, Yitzchak says to him, on Pasuk, um, page 140. <clears throat> on page 140, Esav comes in, Yaakov has... Uh, 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 dressed up and managed to sneak. Hi, he's managed to sneak away with the bracha, and Esav comes in and he starts crying. Yitzchak says, "Listen, I gave your brother the bracha." Already, Esav says, "Well, you only have one bracha." Esav kolovayev. Six lines, six lines from the top. So Yitzchak gives him a bracha. Vayan Yitzchak avi vayomer love hine mishmane yaretz yem moshevecha. From the 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 rich earth will be where you dwell. Rashi says it's Italia Shel Yavan, what we call Italy. Very rich, uh, rich region. Umitala Shamay Meo, from the dew of the heavens. Then he says, Ve'alchar Bechotichia, you will live by the sword. Ve'sachicha Tavod, you'll serve your brother. You'll live by the sword. Now, this generally is understood to allude to the Romans. Right, Ace of his Rome, and it alludes to the Romans, and the Romans were the ones, apparently, uh, 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 who, who took warfare to a higher level, the Roman uh, formations, and they, they were the first ones who had it in an organized manner, and they did a lot of conquering, and so on and so forth. So you live by the sword. Now, the question is what that means, you live by the sword. If I would have written it, I would have written, you, you'll conquer by the sword. Now, you'll conquer by the sword. Why you live by the sword? What does it mean you live by the sword? So I, uh, I experienced it once myself, where uh, I, was in, I was in college. When I was in college, I was a phys ed major. So we had a basketball class. That was one of my, one of my classes. Listen, you know, we had to study. It wasn't easy. And, uh, and so, so what we would go down, we'd come to the gym. I was with all the other jocks. We'd come to the gym. And in the morning, there was the basketball class was an 8 o'clock class. We'd go to the gym. And we'd go shooting around a little bit before the class started. So we're just shooting around one day in the gym. And, uh, you know, you go, you go, you go, everybody shoots around, you grab a rebound, and you go, you go out and you shoot. So I, I remember all of a sudden a guy shoved me. I got a shove. We're going for a rebound. And some guy shoves me. So I turned around. I just, hey, what is that? Now, we did, you know, he, 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 and I just like, like, what was that for? So the guy was about my height, but uh, about as wide as this table. And all I did was say, yeah, what is that? And he looks at me. Immediately his fist goes up. He goes, come on, I'll poke you. I, I didn't want to get poked, right? And he looked like he knows how to poke really well. And I just really, you know, that, that first reaction is, I'll hit you. That, that's the first reaction, is, is, to, is to poke. That's a har Like, you know, like, you know it's like this idea, like, if you, if you insult him, let's take it outside. What will that prove? What will that prove? You take it outside. My reaction when somebody says, well, let's take it outside. Well, okay, but... You go first, and if I'm late, you start without me. You know what? Well, what is what does that say? What does that show? Because you could hit harder. I mean, so what does that prove? Either you're right or you're wrong. What, what did you prove? Hey, let's take it outside. So al kharba means there's. It's not only their conquest. Al kharba means that there's a certain, uh, a, 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 a certain what's it called? Uh, um, um, not a not a personality, a uh, a temperament. There's a certain temperament in the descendants of Esav now. Having said that, take a look at Perak Ches Pasuk, Perak Chof Pasuk Yud Ches. It's on page 846. So um, it actually starts on the 844 at the bottom. Right, last word on 844. So right after the hitting of the rock, um, it says, Vayishlach Moshe Malochi Mikodesh El Melech Edom. Now who is Edom? Who is called Edom? Esav. So we're talking about the descendants of Esav. Says, Ko Amar Achicha Yisrael, your brother Yisrael says, remember Moshe refers to the Jewish people here as Yisrael, not as Yaakov, because Yaakov is a name that implied that he snuck the bracha, so he doesn't want to make mention of that. He says, your brother Yisrael says, Ata Yadate is kolat Hashem so you know all the trouble, all the travail we've been through. 
Rabbi Moshe goes through the history. He yelled out to Hashem. He sent the net messenger and took us out of Egypt. We are in Kodesh, in the city. We're right at the, on the edge of your border. Now Moshe makes an offer. Let us go through your land. We want to cross through your land. We won't pass through a field or vineyard. We won't even drink water from the wells. Derech HaMelech Melech will go through the regular, the, 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 the beaten route. Lo nita yaminu small adashir navar gulecha. Let us just cross through. We won't veer off anywhere. We won't take anything of yours. Let us go through. Vayomer ilavedom lo savor bi pen bacher veitzei likrasecha. So ever, Yadon says, don't pass through because I might come and greet you with the sword. Now, the commentaries point out, well, if we're going to go through and we're not going to eat the, from the fields and the vineyards, we won't drink from the well, so what are the Jewish people going to eat and drink while they go through? So Rashi says, well, he's offering, he's telling the king of Edom, we're going to pay you. We'll pay you for goods and services. It's good for your economy. Let us go through. We're going to go right through. And the king of Edom says, you're not going through because I may come out and greet you with the sword. Now, the first question here is, what's he nervous about? What's Edom nervous about? It's good for your economy. When's the last time you wouldn't let somebody through for your economy? And the answer is, uh, the, the plain answer is, maybe we can turn that off, man. That, that's going to make noise, drive us crazy. The answer is, the plain answer is that, that Edom, is, he's worried, yeah, but what if you do start up with us? We don't, we're not interested in invaders. But that, the, the bigger question here is, what does the word pen mean? If Edom wanted to say, don't go through because I will attack you with the sword. So what should he have said? He should have said, Ki bacherev don't come through because I'm going to attack you with the sword. What does it mean, don't come through because I might attack you with the sword? Number one. Number two, what's your problem? What's your problem? You got, you got, you got, they're going to come through. They're going to be good for your economy. What are you, what, what, why would you resist? So when the commentary says, you know what, you're absolutely right. What the king of Edom was saying was, listen, I agree with you 100%, and logically, strategically, you really, we should allow you through. But you know what? I, I just, I, we just never know, because we're from Esav. And the bracha of Esav was al kharbu For all I know, I don't know, we may, we may just, just lose ourselves and attack you with the sword. Right? We may, we may, because that's our nature. That's al kharbu chatichya. al kharbu chatichya, because of the nature of Edom, it's pen, it's not key. Because we don't know. We don't know when it's going to happen. Even more than that, I heard Rabbi Rachmil, Rabbi Rachmil, uh, he explained when on that posuk, al char uh, we got to turn on some of the air conditioning. Something's got to go on. Well, not that Not that one. That one, that one's, uh, what do you, something, something's got to go on. Yeah. Does that one work? No, don't, don't open the window. Open the window is just going to make things worse. The, uh, no, that one's making noise. That's why we turned it off. So, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Mayor. So, so what Rabbi Rachmel explained on al kharb means why it's not what well, you'll, you'll conquer by the sword is that you actually get you get a certain a certain high from it. You get you get a certain energy from that sort of thing. Now, I see it, those of you that watch sports. I know there's this thing called uh, where's the thing where the two guys get in a ring and almost kill each other. What's it called? What was that? With the, the with the where you, where you could do basically any yeah that that sort of thing. You know, even boxing, which had rules, you know, it's it, it's violence. You know, if you could watch it and watch, oof, wow, did you see his head snap? You know, you know that that means that we've got a little, we've got some ace of in us. That means that there's some ace of in us. You know, you can watch a football game. I used to watch for watch a football game. I like to see the athleticism, and every once in a while, in a football game, you know, somebody gets really clobbered. And something gets really clobbered. So if you're like, yeah, oh boy, did you see that? His head went off with his helmet. You know, oh, that, 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 that means that that's, that's ace of. That's what we have. We all have a little bit of that ace of in us. You know, if you're in shul, you know, if you're, you're, what, you're on the, in, a, in, a, in a train station and all of a sudden a couple of guys start going at it and everybody crowds. I remember being at a hockey game when I was a little kid. I was a little kid the first time, first time I ever went to a hockey game. So I was at the, 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 all of a sudden there's a fight. So everybody stands up. As soon as there's a fight, stands up. I remember an old guy behind me yelling. I was a little kid, very impressed. The old guy, hey, sit down so we can all see. <laughs> I got, I got to see the fight. You got to see the. 
That, that means we've got some Asaph in us. That's, that's, that's Asaph. We should be repulsed by such a thing. We should rebel. I heard about a rabbi who came from Europe. He ran away from the Nazis, came to America. And, you know, while, while American kids, he, he, was, he, was, he, was, he was running with the Mir Yeshiva in Shanghai and running away from the Germans. He was, they come to America where, where, where people are eating hot dogs and, 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 and playing baseball. And so, you know, and everybody's hacking about TV, television. There's an old European rabbi. So he's like, what is TV already? What could it be that everybody's so, so jumping around the TV? So one day he decides, let's see what's TV. So it happens to be a boxing match. So he takes a look and he sees the guy. So he goes, no chazetz, no chazetz. No, hit him again? What, he hit him again? He was nauseated by it. He, he was absolutely, absolutely repulsed by it. That's al char So the king of Edom is saying, to, listen, logically we should let you through, but I just never know if we're going to have a, I once met a guy who was a gang member, or he was a Jewish guy who was a gang member. He wasn't, a, he actually smashed his brother with a baseball bat once. A good friend of mine. He, uh, yeah, this guy. This guy was rough character. So I once spoke to him. He was a member. He had joined a gang. So I was asking him about what you know what what the gangs. He said, "Well, Saturday nights, you know, we go out. You know, sometimes you know we'll party a little bit, but sometimes we even have a rumble." And his eyes lit up when he spoke about the rumble. You know, the partying, the drugs, and the running around. That that was okay. That's already old hat. But when we spoke, up, you know, we'll have a rumble. You know, that that was already that's Asa. That's hundred percent. Yeah, good. So. Oh, because that's exactly what he's telling them, because we want to say, let's go to a bigger question. That's an important question here. I, I had a friend of mine, we were discussing this. We understand, they followed, we learned earlier, that they went where the clouds went. The Anani Akavod, wherever the clouds went, that's when the when cloud moved, that's when they moved. So what, where is this option? What is this about, maybe we're going to go through it. We better turn on something else. It's not cold enough in here. Matt, Matt we have to do it. I'd rather, mm -hmm. I'd rather, I'd rather have, suffer from noise than die of, die of heat. Yeah, yeah, Mayor, what do you say? Well, I wanted to ask that the, the way uh, it's written, how we were taken out of Mitzrayim, perhaps because it's being said to the Edomites, it's not the usual way that it's said. Like That's uh, certainly, my, he's trying to tell, he's trying to indicate to them, listen, uh, you know, don't give us a hard time. He's trying to say, listen, we got out of Mitzrayim. That is in included in there. Very good. That's included in there is the whole background that they should know who we are. You know, so don't uh, don't get too cheeky with us. Yeah, right. That's nice. But okay. So, but what is it by Yishlach Malach? Why doesn't? Well, leave it. Leave it. I don't. I don't want to go. Ahead. Leave. Leave there. Leave there for the time being. Okay. The point is like this. He. 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 Moshe. The, the. The. The question of the clouds is a big question, because it said earlier that wherever the Anonim went. Wherever the Anonim went, wherever the clouds went, that's where the Jewish people went. So what's going on here that they're saying, let us come through your land? Either the clouds are going there or they're not going there. So, so we, 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 we look, we, we, the, uh, uh, the answer that I, I asked, two, two big Tamir Chachamim, they both came up with the same answer. The, uh, the clouds went in that direction, which was an indication that they, will go, that they should go in that direction. However, you could only go in that direction if it doesn't break halacha. So the clouds are telling you we should be going this way. But you're not allowed to trespass on other people's property. That you got to get permission for. So when the clouds show that you should be going through the land of Edom, but you can't just go walking through. You can't go walking through my living room unless you ask me. So then they ask for permission because that's what the halacha demands. And at the point that the Edom might say, no, you can't come. We're not giving you permission. At that point, they retreat. The clouds move somewhere else. That's what the, that was the conclusion they came to, but at the end of the day, they they, they leave they leave what do you call it? Malach is Malach is referring to to, to, to the, when it says Malach is referring to Moshe Rabbeinu. Rashi says it's referring to Moshe. The Malach is Moshe. Malach doesn't always mean an angel. Malach means a messenger. Okay, now take a look. There are a few more points I want to get through. Parshas Chukas. Each one of them is a is a what do you call? It. Okay, our own dies. We did, there's the next section. We did that. And then take a look at Perak Chaf Aleph Pasuk Aleph. Fascinating idea here, really fascinating idea from one of the uh, Hasidic masters. I don't remember which one it was that says it. Perak Chaf Aleph Pasuk Aleph is on page four, 848. This is right after Aaron dies. And then uh, uh, the Torah says, where is it? One second. Here. 
uh, uh, six lines of the, well, well, we'll see Rashi in a second. It says, Vayishma haknani melech harad Yosef anegev, ki bo Yisrael derecha asorim. The Canaanites, which is really the Amalekites in Cagnito, vayilochem bi Yisrael vayishvi menu shevi. They battle against the Jewish people. Now look at the right column of Rashi, six lines from the bottom. Vayishma haknani. Everybody see that right column of Rashi, six lines from the bottom. What did they hear? Shama Shemes Aaron, the Canaanites heard that Aaron died. Vinistalku Anani Hakovod, in the clouds of glory left. So Rashi tells us quite clearly that the clouds of glory, which we know, the Anani Hakovod, were there in the merit of Aaron Akoi. What do we know about these Anani Hakovod? We know earlier when they were at the Red Sea, at the Yamsuf, and the Egyptians were coming up from behind, so Rashi brings down the clouds pr- afforded protection for them. So when the Egyptians shot arrows and threw spears, they bounced off the clouds, deflected them, and then went back on the Egyptians, right? Where were those clouds there? Those clouds there were in the merit of Aaron. So one of the commentaries says, one of the commentaries points out, what does that mean they were there in the merit of our own? It's a beautiful idea, such a beautiful idea. Where do clouds come from normally? How do we get clouds? Where do clouds come from? There's vapor, right? The vapor rises and the vapor forms clouds. That's how we get the physical clouds that we have. Our own was known, and we've mentioned this before, our own was the Oiv Shalom Verodev Shalom, right? Our own was the peacemaker among the Jewish people. When there's peace among people, the way we talk to each other, the way we relate to each other, is different than when people are, are fighting with each other. The vapor that came out of the mouths of the people who are treating each other with respect and honor and being nice to each other, that's the vapor that forms the clouds. In other words, the clouds that are on the Anone Akovod that were formed, symbolically are formed by the vapor of the Jewish people who are the recipients of the influence from Aaron of Akoi. At a deeper level, what it means is, when are we protected from our enemy's spears and, our, and, and arrows and anything that happens there? Well, we're treating each other properly, then we're protected from our enemies. When Jews are fighting with each other, that leaves us vulnerable to our enemies. Right? So when Aaron dies, the clouds of glory disappear. That means he is the influence that brings these clouds. Now look what happens next. Look at the bottom. Look at the three lines from the bottom. Now watch this. By Yisu mihor hor. They leave this mountain on the mountain, which is where Aaron, uh, three lines to the bottom, 848. They leave for this Hor Hahar, this little mountain on top of the big mountain, which is where Aaron had died. Derech Yamsuf, Lisbo, Vezeret, Zedom. They go around the land of Edom. Vatik Tsar Nefesh Ha'om Baderech. Now pay attention very carefully, because there's a fundamental concept in human nature here. The people become very frustrated. How does the arts go translate? But the, the, the spirit grew short. That doesn't mean, I, I don't like that translation. What is it, the spirit grew short? That, that, that sounds like somebody translating literally. It means the people got frustrated and flustered. They speak against God and against Moshe. Why did you take us out of Egypt to die in the desert? There's no bread and there's no water. There's, there's, we're, we're, we're tired of this, of this insignificant bread. Now you have to understand that they're in the 40th year. They've been eating it for 39 years. So they're looking for a gripe over here. And look at Rashi, top line. This, this uh, how does the arts go translate? Insubstantial, that's not a bad word. It says Rashi. Right line, column, top line. Lefisha man nivla beivarim. The man was absorbed into their limbs. Krau klokel. Amru, they said. Asid haman azeh sheit pach b'meinu. Listen, we they didn't relieve themselves when they ate man. The man was absorbed into their system, and they didn't have to relieve themselves. They said, well, eventually this is going to swell up. Klum yeshi lo disha shemachdis veino motzi. Is there any human being that eats and doesn't have to relieve it? Doesn't have to release it? It's, it's, it's clearly a, an, an, a, an unjustified gripe. Because you've been doing it for 40 years and you haven't had a problem. So all of a sudden now you wake up one day and say, hey, we don't like the man anymore. You know, and eventually it's going to swell up. You know, for 40 years, 40 years you've been okay. Nothing's happened. So what do you do? The Torah teaches, how do you handle disgruntled people? What do you do with people who are disgruntled for no good reason? 
וישלח השם בעומס הנחושים האסטרופים. השם sends venomous serpents. Oh, they'll get you. They'll get you. Get, get you. Put things in the proper person. All of a sudden, hey, uh, yeah, yeah, that mun is pretty good. You know, I've always liked mun. All of a sudden, their, their venomous serpents come. The serpents come. Why snakes? Why snakes? What is it? Why is the serpents? And it, it, it switches back and forth between Nechoshim, Srofim. And so what does Moshe Rabbeinu do? Take a look. We'll, we'll explain in a second. So the people come to Moshe. They say, we, we, we did bad. Look at, uh, uh, the, fifth, look at the, the fifth line. Vayomer Hashem al Moshe, Asei lecha sorof, make a serpent, which apparently one of the commentators says a sorof is the most venomous of all the snakes. Vesimo so al nes, make a, uh, uh, put it up on a, on a, on a, on a uh, what do you call it, on a beam. Vehoya kol anoshuch v'roz avachai. Anybody who got bit should stare at this, at this, uh, 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 image of the snake and they'll be cured. Now that's very strange because normally when you get bit, if you get bit by a snake, the last thing you want to look at is a snake. We had a kid in our neighborhood, by the way, got bit by a snake. He was on a hike uh, last year, last year, two years ago, a kid, uh, 18, 19 year old kid, he got bit by a snake and uh, he was at the point, he was at the point, he was in the hospital, the doctor said to the family, come and say goodbye. He said, it's not going to, he's got three, about three hours left and then all of a sudden it just changed. And he, you know, a few couple of days later, walked out of the hospital. You know, they, they made a pseudo so It was like, what do you call it? So, so, the cure over here, Moshe Rabbeinu makes this image of a snake, and he puts it up on a. How does the arts go translate a, on a pole in a copper snake? And everybody's going to look at the snake, and they're going to get better from it. Well, what's going on here? What, what does it mean? The simple explanation is that what they did wrong. What did they do? They complained about food that they're getting for free. We got food. We're getting free food without working. We want to work. We want to work for our livelihood. We don't want these free. We want these handouts. We want to work. Where do we find a creature that gets food for free? What was the curse of the snake? You eat the, the dust of the earth. What does it mean? Everywhere you go, you're going to find your food. Everywhere you go, you'll have food. Why is that a curse? Why is that a curse? Okay, the dirt, the dirt certainly doesn't sound like a way. There are those that say that when they said you'll eat dirt, the dust of the earth, it means rodents that are hanging around it, which is what snakes eat. But for one thing is snakes don't taste their food. They don't chew. What do snakes do? They just gotta, you know, they open up their jaws and they swallow it. So it's compared to, you know, I met a kid once who's, uh, his, I think his mother had passed away. The father remarried, and the stepmother was, you know, the usual stepmother out of, the stepmother uh, uh, said to the father, listen, I don't want him around. So the father was very wealthy, he gave the kid a credit card. He said, here, go pay for an apartment, buy your car, but just you're, you're on your own. So the kid was suicidal. The kid was suicidal. I mean, most teenagers, it's a dream. You know, give me the credit card, give me the thing, you know, what, what could be better? But the father, you're banished from the father. I don't want to see you and I don't want to hear from you. Just take it and you have your produce. That's what Hashem said to the snake. He said, listen, here, just take it. Just go, go. I don't want to see you. I don't want to look at you. Just get out of here. That's the punishment of the snake. So you have your food everywhere. Here the Jewish people have their food. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is obviously providing it for them, not because he's banishing them. He's giving it to them on a silver platter, and he's taking care of them, and he's nurturing them through 40 years in the desert. And you're kvetching about that. So you're going to be, remember, Hashem pays me to connect and me to. You get what you deserve. You're getting snakes because the snake also gets his food for free. You don't appreciate it, so I'll show you somebody who also gets their food. Their food is given to them on a platter. So the serpent's come, number one. Number two, what did the original serpent do? You know what he's accused of? The original serpent spoke Lashon Hara. He spoke Lashon Hara about God. He said to Adam and Chava, God doesn't want you to eat from the fruit because he's nervous you're going to be like him. You spoke Lashon Hara. What did the Jewish people do over here? They spoke Lashon Hara. You spoke Lashon Hara, you get punished by the original Lashon Hara of the world, which is the serpent. What happens? What's the cure? They put the snake up. Why? By the way, that's why, I always wondered about this. I never knew. When you go to a pharmacy, what's the sign by a pharmacy? A snake on a thing. I don't know, oh, gee, you know, that's not what I want to see when I'm going to get cured. Is a snake on a, a snake on a pole, you know. Where do they get that from? Like everything else, or they got it from here. That's where the idea came from, the snake on the pole. That's why the pharmacies had that, because that was a cure. How is that a cure? What do you say, Jake? Well, I, just, I wanted to ask a question. One second. How is this a cure? 
Why is this the cure? Look at this snake on the pole that you'd be cured. So anybody who hasn't died, if you're still alive, to look, to look, to, if you're still alive, stare, focus on this thing. It says you focus on the snake and you'll be cured. Well, well, what's the cure here? Well, how do we ever get cured of a spiritual ailment? Prayer. What? Chuba. Chuba. What's the chuva over here? Look at the snake and realize what you've done. That's the cure. Not that you look at the snake and, oh, good, I feel better because there's a, there's a cobra. Right? You look at the snake and the, then by focusing on the snake, it makes you realize what you've done wrong. And by realizing what you've done wrong, then you'll do chuva. That becomes, that's why, that, that's the cure over here. Now, they're, they're very, yeah, go ahead, Jake, what were we going to ask? Yeah, so you said they were punished by snakes because they built Lash Mara. So then why weren't they punished by snakes? Ken is a kasha. Different situations. Whatever it was, over here was over here was the serpent. So again, Ken has a kasha. Come out other other situations. Whatever the punishment was under circumstances. But here, specifically, they're complaining about the mun. So have some snakes. Right? That always changes people's attitudes. Yeah, guys in yeshiva sometimes complain about food in the dining room. Oh yeah, food's no good. Have a couple of cobras. No, 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 no. What? No, no, no. I love those. I just love those corn patties. You know, my favorite. You know, you know. They're, they're, that's always the way. That's always the way to get people in the proper. But if people got nothing to fetch about. Then you give them something. You know, I had a uh, woman across the street from me. My wife was. My wife was uh, had given birth. And so the women, after they give birth, they go to these, uh, they go to what's called a Beit HaChomah. They go to a convalescent home for about three or four days, which is an echo, a very good thing. It gives them a chance to get, regain some strength before they come home and deal with the kids again. So I was taking care of the kids, you know. And I, uh, you know, I'm a master at, at putting a corn patty in a microwave, you know. Because I'd ask my kids, okay, what do you want for supper tonight? And then regardless of what they said, it was corn patties in a microwave. <laughs> you know, at least it sounded like they had a choice. Yeah, I think I did make some French fries, and uh, and what do you call it? You know, and it was it was like a steady diet of corn patties and brownies. You know, and at a certain point, I remember one of my kids looking at me and goes, "Daddy, when's mommy coming home?" <laughs> the kid was hungry. Now, I remember I was traumatized because I I fed the kids and I thought I was doing a good job. Then one of the kids comes, Daddy, when are we going to eat? I said, whoa, 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 what's with the eating? We just ate about seven hours ago. I mean, how often does this happen? You know, you know, you know what, what's that, another meal? You know, you know, so, so I was, you know, so my kids were, my kids were on, on and, and, you know, on survival mode, you know. And there was, a, there was, a, my wife even said to me before she went, I remember she's giving me these last instructions. She goes like, when you do the laundry, blah, 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 blah. And when they bathe, when you give the kid a bath, you know, the, the shampoo, and then she's giving me this whole list of instructions. I'm listening politely, and I'm, you know, just listening, you know. And she, and I said to her, I said to her, I just want to explain something to you, right? All of those hygienic, I will give them back to you, happy and healthy, Bezras Hashem. But all of those hygienic action verbs ending in ing, like washing, shampooing, cleaning, they ain't happening, right? <laughs> and, you know, by my attitude was, you know, changing clothes meant. You change with him, and you change with him. That was how they changed clothes. And if you wore your pajamas to school, that's fine. You know, <laughs> that, that's just fine. So they, you know, the, then I gave them back happy and healthy. So at some point, there's a little old lady. She was nifter already. But she was about. She was well into her 90s, and uh, and she was like, "So how how are things going?" I said, "Yeah, you know, the kids are having a rough time. You know, it's a lot of corn patties and brownies." She goes, "You know what?" I was running away. We ate grass. Oh, they'll be okay. They'll be okay. And I, and I like, yeah, yeah, they will be okay. Good. I, I got her brother. You know. So, you know, so when you've been in a forest, when you've been running from Nazis in a forest, eating grass and eating grass and leaves to survive, so then, uh, then, 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 then it puts everything into perspective. Okay. Now there's a very, very interesting takeover. This is this is fascinating. What happened here to the Jewish people? that right after the death of Aaron, they start complaining. Aaron dies, the next thing you know, the Jewish people are complaining. So one of the Farshim explains like this. It's very difficult for us to compartmentalize our personalities. We have certain tendencies. If the tendency comes out, it's gonna be coming out all the time, meaning, there are mitzvahs between man and God, and there are mitzvahs between man and your fellow man. What's the common denominator between the mitzvahs? The common denominator between the mitzvahs is, 
I'm not thinking about myself. I'm thinking about, when I put on tefillin, I'm thinking about my obligations to Hashem. Theoretically, I'm thinking about Hashem, so to speak. If I give tzedakah, I'm thinking about both. I have an obligation to give tzedakah, and I'm thinking about my fellow man. If I clean the dishes on a Motzei Shabbos, if I do the dishes on Saturday night, all right, we're into science fiction here, but if I do the dishes on Saturday nights, so I'm thinking about somebody else. As soon as you start thinking about, you take your focus off of others, then you're gonna take your focus off of God too, because it's all coming from the same area. Are you focused outwards or you're focused inwards? If you're focused outwards, you're gonna be focused outwards in most everything. It doesn't mean you're gonna be perfect, none of us are perfect. But as a pattern, you're gonna be focused outwards. If you start focusing inwards, you're going to be focused inwards in all areas. So a person who is not a believer in God, even when they're nice to other people, for the <laughs> most part, they're nice to other people because of what's in it for them. If you read the book, what's if you read the book, uh, uh, how to win friends and you know, how to win friends and manipulate people, right? So that's sorry, how to win friends and influence people. So there's one thing that emerges. The, the book is a very interesting book, and a lot of a lot of Tamid Chachamim have read this book because the mechanics of the book work, and the mechanics of the book are proper. There's only one problem in the book, and it's a th- recurring theme. Even on the front of the book, I have the book at home, and on the front it says, as the you know, like like before the title, you know, when they give the introduction to the title. Now you too can get ahead. Now you too can reach the top. Now you too, how to get, how to win friends and influence people. In other words, the whole purpose of the book, the whole purpose of being nice to other people, is so that you can benefit from it. Okay, so the Torah attitude is you have to be nice to other people because the Torah wants you to be nice to other people. Now, okay, even if there's nothing in it for you. Here, what happened to the Jewish people? Aaron is the influence of concern for others, right? He's the bein adam lechaveiro, be peace, making peace between your fellow man and fellow man. How do you make peace with somebody? You know when you make peace? Where is there peace and where is there quarrel? When you think about yourself, then there's fighting. And when you think about the other person, then there's peace. That's the way it works. There's a, that's, the whole, that's the whole package right there. That's marriage right there. The Chazonish, the Chazonish said, when his sister asked him, the Chazonish's sister married the stipler. So his sister asked the Chazonish, give me some marriage advice. I'm getting married, give me some advice on marriage. The Chazanish said one sentence, which is the entire marriage. He said, at the moment that you want to take, that's the moment you have to give. That's what the Chazanish said. That's the whole Torah on one foot. That's the Torah of marriage. And so if a person, the influence of interpersonal relationships, which is our own, that influence, however he managed that influence is manifested. When our own disappears, when our own dies, so now there's no longer to focus on other people. When you take your focus off of other people, you take your focus off of God as well. And therefore you start complaining about, against God. Where is that coming? It's coming from the same place. It's coming from internal, fo- focusing inwardly, then you're not focusing outwardly the way you should. And that's why sometimes people forget that in Yiddishkeit, I, I, th- I think I mentioned to you once, they did an experiment with some secular college students. They gave them a paper. They said, draw seven or ten images that would make you think of Judaism, what Judaism is about. So they drew a Sefer Torah, and a menorah, and a mezuzah, and tefillin, and I thought, what was the common denominator of what they drew? They only drew pictures of things that are being man between man and God. Nobody drew a picture of somebody picking somebody up off the floor when they fell. Nobody, pictured, nobody drew a picture of somebody who's inviting somebody into the house for Shabbos. Those are, what's that? They're harder to draw. That's true. That is true. But that's not why they didn't do it. If I would tell you to write it down, they wouldn't have written it down in words either. Because we think of religion, we think of the man-to-God focus. And a person has to know that Yiddishkeit is made up of, and they're inseparable. They go, they go hand in hand. If you're focused, really focused on God, the people most focused on God are also the people most focused on, on other people. Why is it that all of the medical relief organizations in Israel, the people help, help, help people with medical relief, have been founded by Frum Jews? Why is it that all of the organizations that, 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 that provide funds for people who need funds are run by Frum Jews? Most of them have been founded and run by Frum because that's part of Avod Hashem. That's part of Avod Hashem. How come there are no gemachim in Tel Aviv? Right? No, no gemach. I thought they're the people. That they're the they're the they're the, the ones who are also you know all the, everybody's like, everybody's just wonderful. And we love everybody. We love everybody. You love yourself. That's the answer. Nobody's thinking about anybody else. In Torah, a Torah Jew thinks, and it's all coming. It's all the same. It's all the same package. Okay.
one more point here. Take a look at Perikhaf Aleph Pasuk Dal. I skipped this back on page eight eight forty eight. So the Chassam Sofer says like this. After they're told, I, I'm backing off for a second, and um, this is right before this is it, 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 Pasuk Dalit. Vayisu mehor hahor derech yamsuf lisbov es eretz edom. They go from hor hahor. Three lines from the bottom, eight forty-eight. Vayisu mehor hahor derech yamsuf lisbov es eretz edom to go around the land of Edom. Vatikzar nefesh ha'ambadorach. Okay, so we read this once, and it says that the people got frustrated. So the Chassam Sofer says there's a pasuk that says Saviv Rishoim Yehalechun. The wicked people, the Rishoim, they go around in a circle. He says this idea of going around the land of Edom. Edom is Esav. We said, what does it mean to go around the land? of Edom, and then they end up frustrated. So Chassam Zohar says this alludes to that cycle. How many people are on the planet now? How many people are on the planet? Seven, seven billion, eight billion people? Okay, seven, eight billion people. Out of those seven, eight billion people, uh, uh, there's a handful of people who avoid this. Almost, I'd say, if there are eight billion people, then it's seven billion, nine hundred, and whatever the number is, you know, other than a handful of from Jews, they're all going around the mountain. You get up, you go to work in order to buy food, in order to have enough energy to then go to work the next day, and you go to sleep, and you wake up, and then you go to work in order to get money, in order to buy enough food, to have enough energy to get up the next day, right? And you go around this circle, the mountain of Edom. Edom represents Esav and the values of Esav, which is living for this world. So you're caught in that sleep, eat, work cycle. There's a sleep, eat, work cycle where most people in the world, if they ever stop and ask themselves, well, why am I doing this? The question is so annoying that they just go right back to work or go get, get absorbed into food or entertainment because they want to have to confront the question. And that's why all these politicians, like in Israel, the secular politicians, I'm only using this as an example, not for, for politics, but the secular politicians says this, we want to advance the Israeli society. We want, to, we want to get elected so we could help the Israeli society advance. There's only one problem with that statement. You know what it is? They didn't tell you advance to what? They didn't tell you advance to where? What are you trying? Let's make America great again. Yeah, you make America great for what purpose and how do you make us great? Well, obviously by having more money. Right? And what are you going to do with the money? Well, I'm going to buy something so I can go to work the next day. You know, you know well, well, you're in that cycle. And what does that cycle inevitably end with? Vatikzar nefesh ha'ambaderech. The people become frustrated. You end up flustered. You end up, you know, why am I doing all this? What am I doing it for? And that's because you're going around in the circle represented by Edom, which is Esav and the Esav values. That's what the first, that's what I think the Chassam Sofer is one who says that. And it's very, very true. I just spoke to a couple uh, who were contemplating uh, uh, a from couple who are living in Israel, and they're contemplating moving to going to America to try to do, to, 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 to go to America to, to, to see if they could advance themselves. So they were, kind of, were speaking about whether it's a good idea, should they investigate or not. I said to them, before you could answer that question of should you advance yourself, you have to ask yourself, what do you want to advance yourself to? What's your end goal? If you first get to that end goal, define the end goal, and then you could determine whether or not this is a good thing to do. People who have an end goal, we have an end goal. Our end goal is to serve Hashem. That's our end goal. Now I saw that I, I don't. The expression sounds like we're a bunch of like. And that's the goal. That goal involves eating cholt on Shabbos, and that goal sometimes involves playing tennis, and that goal sometimes involves having a good time. It, it involves a lot of things. But that's the end goal. So people say to me, should I live in Israel? The answer, to, and I heard this from Avigdor Miller on a tape, I had come up with the answer before. Avigdor Miller, I couldn't, Avigdor, Avigdor, you've heard of Avigdor Miller. Avigdor Miller said on a tape, asking if you should live in Israel is like asking if you should live in Chicago. He happened to use Chicago as an example. So I was very happy. 
The answer is, if this is the best place for you to live, in order to advance towards your goal, so you should live here. But there are a lot of factors. Will you have a parnasa? Will you have a place to learn? Do you have a shul, will, 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 will you have a good marriage over here? Or will you be under stress? Do you have family that can help you when you're raising children? There are a lot of factors that go into that. And it could be that if you live in Chicago, if you live in Pittsburgh, well, maybe not Pittsburgh, but if, if you live, you know, certainly, you know, if you, if you live in what, if you, if you live in, in what do you call it, you go, you live in Sao Paulo, you know, it, 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 the, it, the question is, is this the best situation for me to advance towards my goal? But if you don't have a goal defined, though, what's the point? I don't even know why I'm doing it. I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing. If you don't know where you're going, you're going to get lost. You're just, you're going to get lost because you didn't, you're not heading towards your goal. I was, I was, when, I, I told you, I, my, 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 I'm not great at, inst at driving, at, at following instructions. Now, when I got married, when I got married, so, so I had trouble. I told you that I, I was heading to Columbus from Chicago and ended up on the way to Detroit. I told you that story, right? I ended up at, ended up at, a, at a truck stop. All right, now, that was only the first half of the story. The second half of the story was that we left Columbus to go back to Chicago a couple of weeks later. We had to go to Israel. We were going to, we were going to spend Shabbos in Chicago and we we're going to Israel on Monday. So my wife and I packed up our car. We left Columbus on a Motzei Tisha B'Av, Thursday night Motzei Tisha B'Av. And our plan was to drive, to, instead of driving Friday morning, because it's a little too, too risky on Arab Shabbos, we left Motzei Shabbos, Motzei Tisha B'Av, about 11 o'clock. We were going to drive for a couple hours, stay at some roadside motel, get up in the morning, and then go driving back for another four or five hours, four hours. We'd break up the drive into two, and we had plenty of time. We'd arrive in Chicago at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, plenty of time, no problem. Okay. So I got on the highway and I started driving, and uh, I, I saw I got on 70 East. Now, not having lots of experience driving between, so I figured 70 East meant 70 coming out of the East. Yeah, that was not a good thing. So we drove for a couple hours, about 11 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock at night. And we drove for a couple hours, wonderful, go to sleep for the night, wake up the next morning. We start driving for about uh, uh, maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes, and all of a sudden I see mountains. That's not good. There are no mountains between Chicago and Columbus. Uh, between Illinois and Ohio, you can basically roll a marble, you know, it'll get there. It'll get there. Just flick a marble, it'll go from Chicago to Columbus. So I say I see mountains. So I'm saying, oh, that's like, ooh. And I drive for another five or ten minutes, I see a sign that says, Welcome to West Virginia. Oy now, under normal circumstances, under normal circumstance, I would have gone, yeah, West Virginia. And I would start singing a John Denver song. I was in no, I was in no mood to sing. No, I've driven two hours in the wrong direction. So I got out of my car, and the first thing I did was call my mother in Chicago. Now, what I should have just done is driven back to Columbus and just stayed there for shops. I don't know what we were thinking. We're young and foolish. And it's an Arab shot. It's a Friday morning. So I get out of my car. I was in a Camaro. Now I get out of my car. It's got all of our belongings packed in there. My, it was so, the car was so packed, my wife couldn't even get in there. She, she had to get in there and then put, I put the something on her lap. She, she couldn't even sit there. We were absolutely packed. I call my mother and I ask her what time is lift benching. So now we've got, it turns out we've got 10 and a half hours to make a nine hour drive. There's not a lot of room to spare. So I get in the car. Now my wife apparently thought up until that point that the numbers on the speedometer, anything past 55, she was under the impression up until that point that they were only there for design because the minute I went past 55 miles an hour, she told me you're going past 55 miles an hour. Then I get back into the car and she says to me, floor it, right? Yeah. It was music to my ears, right? That was all I needed. So these were, this was back in the day they had, remember they had the CB radios, what were they called, CV radios? This was before Waze and before anything. So the truckers all had these. So what I did was I kept finding truckers because they had these radios to know where the cops are. So wherever I saw these truckers, I just got between two trucks. So we went to about 85, 90. Oh, that was fun. That was the only good part of the trip, right? And we made it into Chicago about 45 minutes before Shabbos, right? So if you don't know where you're going and you don't have the direction, you're gonna get lost, right? You have to have a goal. And if you have the goal, then the cycle of life that people, that people are caught up in, the cycle of life has a purpose. If you don't have a goal, so it's like a life is just, it's meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. You're just going through the motions day after day, wondering why are we doing this? That's what the Torah is teaching you. All right, to be continued. Yeah.